um, yeah, yes, a very warm well, welcome. Warm welcome to all of you. So, hello everyone. Welcome to the Black Knowledge Society's meeting following our third edition, Out of the Darkness, What Beyond, Black Lives Matter and Black History Month. I am Sherelle. And I'm Esther. And we are joined by our colleague, Rudy. And we are the TBKS team. And today we are joined by two guest panelists. So please welcome brother Nia Amara, the Managing Director of Nas National Association of Black Supplementary Schools. The National Association of Black Supplementary Schools is an umbrella group for black supplementary schools in the UK. UK. We also have brother Chalice Richardson, founder and director of Bee Empowerment. Chalice Richardson is the founder of direct, founder and director of Bee Empowerment, um, and Chalice is a qualified social worker, parent facilitator, educator, and speaker who has worked for over 20 years within the youth justice sector. Okay, so a very warm welcome once again, everyone. Um, it's lovely to see so many of you um, already online. Um, I'm sure there'll be many more to join um, throughout the course of the evening. Um, there is so much that could be said, but um, I'll keep it very succinct just because of time. Um, and, and what I want to do is to basically share um, a very poignant quote um, from the great Marcus Garvey. Um, and that quote goes like this. Uh, so, never forget that intelligence rules the world and ignorance carries the burden. Therefore, remove yourself as far as possible from ignorance and seek as far as possible to be intelligent. And I think that's um, a, a very good uh, sort of backdrop for us to sort of frame this entire um, meeting against. Um, and I will like to hand over to Sherelle. So once again, thank you all for joining us today. And um, before we commence, <laughs> Um, I'd like to go over, over some house rules. So if you do have any questions, um, we ask you to switch your camera on in the question and answer section. And by doing this, you also would need to raise your hand in the chat tools and then we will sort of um, come to you and um, sort of hear your question to our panelists. So we'll start by asking our questions. So I'd like to address, I'd like to address um, Brother Nia with the um, first question that we received. Um, what do you believe the objectives of the Black Lives Matter protests in the UK were? And have they been met? Was it symbolism or substance? Well, I, I believe that the, the, the people involved with the actual, with the actual process, they, um, they fully believed in substance. They, they really did want to change. They put themselves on the front line and went to the marching and stuff. They really did want change. Um, obviously, a lot of passion was driven on by events in America, not necessarily events in the UK, but, you know, things are happening in the UK that they were angry about, but the catalyst what was promoted so highly that went on in America with George Floyd. So, you know, there's probably a lot of stuff that was building up. But again, we took the lead from what was going on in America, instead of taking the lead for ourselves, because there's issues going on here that people didn't want to march about. We always take, take the lead from America. But in, in saying that, you know, they, they, they were active, they did want change, made it specifically um, what changes they wanted. And, they, and, and quite frankly, some changes has come out of it. Statues have come down or the, or the truth has come out about certain characters like Winston Churchill. You know, things have always been said, but not on a national scale or a, or a national debate. So. The you know things came out. Obviously now we're seeing a few a lot more black people on TV, which has upset the um the natives of this land. But there you go. But that came out of the Black Lives Matter marching and demonstrations. So changes have been made, and a lot of organisations, including my own, we sort of had an influx of people wanting to be part of the struggle, want to be part of solutions. So you know I had an influx of people donating. People have sort of come to me and say, listen, I want to be part of change, which is great. But in saying that, it's died away. The energy has kind of gone amongst our population anyway. A lot of the energy is gone now and probably waiting for the next thing to be upset about and to start rising up against. Yeah, yeah. So leading on from that question, what can we understand about a society that embraces aspects of black history for a month, just a month each year? I mean, 
how do we you know how do we understand that sort of like black history just for a month like how do we sort of make it so that black history month is not black history is throughout the year really throughout it's in our day to day it is throughout the day throughout the year we've got black black history walks doing events throughout the year we've got black history studies doing things every year all year round we've got robin walker all year round that's just to name a few so that's the mainstream and the, and the schools might do um, black history month for a month but you know activists in our own organization are doing things all year round and and for and for those people who do not get african history uh, in in their lives or in their household having it for one month is better than not having it at all and the idea of having it for a month is to um perpetuate and to encourage you to carry on learning throughout the year you don't have to rely on that one month so it, it's a it's a catalyst for people who don't get it generally but you know use that month to keep on learning throughout the year because there's plenty of organizations and there's plenty of events going on all year round you can see that in a newsletter i do every single week yeah. new events every week in a nabs newsletter every week all year round so use that month to just spur you on to learning more. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, Can we um, direct that same question? If, if, we, if um, we direct the question as well to, to Chalice, um, if, if you'd like to take that question, the first question, which was, um, do you believe that the objectives of the BLM, specifically BLM UK, um, do you feel that the objectives have been met? Um, and do you have a sense of what those objectives were? Uh, to be honest, I'm not fully clear on what the objectives were. I, I put it down to a bit of ignorance on my bit, on my part. But in all honesty, from my point of view, my perspective is that I saw that the meet, uh, the protests were able to galvanise young people to get involved, to do things, and to basically have a voice. However, I didn't think it addressed the issues that were deep rooted and entrenched within our society, such as psychological issues, emotional issues, physical and mental issues. And it didn't basically touch on the topics that I felt, the agendas that I felt warranted uh, recognition, such as housing, education, poverty, and economy. So for me, uh, I understand they were trying to do something and I respect them for doing what they were doing. However, I felt that uh, we kind of missed the trick there somewhat, somewhere. So in your view, then, it was a missed opportunity, would you say? To some degree. I just felt that it was more about symbolism more than substance. Yeah. I felt that uh, out of it, we've got a lot of white guilt. And to me, that doesn't do anything great for us, personally, from my perspective. I, and I believe that at the end of the day, we could have, like, like Brother Nia said, the emphasis and the focus and the catalyst behind it was based upon America. It wasn't our issues. So therefore, I felt that our issues basically were sidelined. Yeah. And um, just from that then, what, what do you feel um, are the sort of primary um, issues? I know you've obviously alluded to, to housing um, and to education and so on. Um, but, but what would you say are, are some of the sort of um, prime issues um, that we really need to, you know, um, recognize as, as as uk specific i think we need to recognize the, the four points that are raised because the interrelationship between them basically makes it hard for for individuals to kind of get an even footing on the system so when we're looking at housing because of the poor housing and the poor situation where we are we are given inferior schools to some degree because of where we're situated where we are so then the schools that we that are, a lot of our young people access definitely are within an area that is ignored. And then because the education is substandard to a degree, we then basically are faced with the poverty issues because how can our young people basically elevate themselves if they're, they're, they're receiving a substandard education? And then the teaching in itself from the schools and the governing bodies, apart from individuals like Nia, Brother Nia there, they don't allow us to basically be ready for, to be dealing with economical uh, issues that are out there. So for me, 
I feel that those are the points that needed to be addressed and, and they were ignored. Yes, Rabbi, you wanted to add to that. Yeah. Yeah, so um, some members, some people from Black Lives Matter, they contacted me, asking me to be part of the protest. And, and I'm like, well, what's your stance on black on black crime? What's yeah. your stance on county lines? What's your stance on black children being kidnapped and used for drug dealing? You know, what's your stance on, on, on crime in our community? Not in America, in UK. What's your stance on domestic violence? What's your stance on black women being killed by black men? What's your stance on Because we can't just jump up and down when a white cop kills a black man in, in America. What about the, the issues in this country? And they couldn't answer those questions. They couldn't answer. So um, what, what does that actually tell us then about the um, BLM UK movement um, in, in summary? What, what, would you be, what would be your conclusions? My yes. conclusion was they just continually take a lead from America instead of tackling the issues in the UK. Because we, we, we all know that when America, when, when America sneezes, the UK goes and wipes their nose. <laughs> well, we've got our issues now, the UK is a cold, cold, yeah, quite. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. OK, um, Ch Chalice, if, if you would. Yeah, and uh, just to follow on from that point, uh, I think that obviously when uh, organisations such as BLM we have to identify who they're funded by. So that will always have some kind of impact on the agenda. And as Brother Nia raised the points, these are issues that are close to home to our community. But are there issues for the funder of, for the funders of BLM? Maybe not, I don't think so. Because maybe those issues don't even register on their radar. So therefore, my, my, my view is I often say, if anyone has a hand in what we're doing, we, they're usually basically, oh, if they hand it out to us, they have a hand in it and what we do and how we go about doing our business. So that's my view when it came to that whole BLM. Yeah. And, and this, is the, this is the first time I've ever heard of protesters being paid. Yeah. Some people, <laughs> there were some people got paid per person they brought to a protest. I've never heard of that before. Yeah. So if, if certain people weren't being paid, I wonder how many people would have turned up for these protests. Yeah. Yeah. They had lawyers, they had their medical teams on, on board, every process. They had people, it's well organized, but being paid to protest, I'm like, wow. Yeah. It does, it does, yeah, it does beg the question what really is the, um, the agenda that sits behind um, the, the movement um, that is BLM um, yeah. UK, you know? Um, and I think it's very important to make that distinction and to recognize. Um, that, that America's um, BLM movement and the UK's BLM movement are actually slightly different. Two, yeah, yeah, two, two, two separate, separate um, uh, entities. Um, so, do you want to move on to the next question? Yeah, so we're moving on to the next question, which is, um, what's your response to the public discourse relating to the Sainsbury's Christmas campaign? And should we be engaging in this level of conversa conversation? Is it significant? Okay, Chalice, would you like to go ahead? We'll start with you on yeah. this one. <laughs> Sainsbury's campaign for me, I think it done what it was supposed to do, personally. And uh, we live in a country that is very divisive. And at times, I feel they throw things out there that will basically attract some attention. And honestly speaking, for me personally, I was more disappointed in the fact that we as people got upset for the way that uh, the Europeans carried on, for them representing us. Because as far as I'm concerned, that we have an attitude of always wanting to be included and we always want to basically be uh, integrated in stuff that as far as I'm concerned, doesn't really necessarily represent us. So for me, when I saw the campaign and I then saw the uproar, I thought to myself, well, that those individuals who are moaning and who are arguing, those are the stockholders. And, and those who those are who Sainsbury's basically are kind of looking to, that's their demographic personally, because let's be real, uh, they only added that they only done that advert because of what we're going through at this moment in time. We've been here for years and that has never happened. I've grown used to that. To, to probably see 10, 15 adverts and we're not represented. 
So then all of a sudden I've seen an advert or seen back to back black adverts. Back -back, uh, yeah. For me personally, it doesn't matter. As far as I'm concerned, we need to adapt a leap from a lot of the other cultures who are not basically being represented and they're not bothered. They're not bothered yeah. because they have their own platforms. They're not bothered because yeah. at the end of the day, when they are representing the other cultures, they're not representing them to the degree of how we would represent ourselves. It's still a narrative that isn't, is far from us, far from representing us in the best light. So, you know, I just feel that we need to recognize that we ourselves can do for ourselves and stop wanting to be integrated and stop wanting to be part of these things that don't even recognize us. Sainsbury's is over 150 years old. And let's be real, when Sainsbury's was first created, could we even shop there? Nah, I don't think so. And, and, and just looking at the evidence lately, Sainsbury's has only basically just this year started looking at the ethnicity pay gap with uh, people of color and everyone else. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm not bothered by what they want to do. And, and I'm surprised that everyone else is getting, is taking, is in, up in arms about it. Yeah. I think that's, yeah. The, that's the element of surprise um, from, from our point of view as well, is that we, we're surprised that people are surprised yeah. um, ultimately. <laughs> so um, yeah, um, bro brother, yeah, brother Neo, if you'd like to also address that question. I mean, I'm a, I'm a 70s baby. I grew up in the 70s. So I'm from the era where your mum used to shout, black people on TV. I used to run down. Even if you saw a black person on a TV advert, which was extremely rare, if there was a black person on a TV advert, we would rush down just to view the person on an advert. How embarrassing is that? Yeah. Black people on TV, quick adverts on. You've got one minute left, and you're running down just to see that. It was a phenomenon. Yeah. Desperate we were. <laughs> That, that is how bad, when I explained that to my, my, I was talking to my daughter today and explaining that to her again, what, what the situation was. She's like, really for an advert? I'm like, that is how bad it was. We just weren't seen anywhere. But then, you know, come like the um, late nineties now, we started seeing a, a few black people on, but they were with white partners. Mm -hmm. So we, we was glad for those crumbs. Just having a black person there, even though they, they're not in a black family, but just having a black face there was something. It was progress. So we was glad for that. And now all of a sudden, all of a sudden now, probably on the black on the back of BL, um, Black Lives Matter, we're seeing whole black families. Yeah. And it's like everywhere. And, I, and I'm sitting there, because I don't watch TV that much, but when, when I watch it uh, every now and then, I see like a black family there, a black family there, and black people there. I'm like, wow, we're all over the place. And I've, I've gone back to my old um, school friends, uh, to uh, uh, my old slave name, on my Facebook page, and I started um, reading their comments. Now, these same people I was going to school with, they're all about all these immigrants over here, and we're, it's not, we're not black, we're not represented anymore because there's black people on the news, and, and there's black people on, on um, um, loose women, and there's black people on adverts everywhere. No, I can't see myself in my own country. I'm like, well, too bad. What do you think we was going through all that time? But well, you didn't say anything then, did you? Yes, yeah. Kind of yeah. Anyway. But, but Brother Lee, you mentioned the word progress. And I just wanted to sort of um, unpick that a bit more, you know, when we use the word progress um, based on the representations that we see in the media, what type of progress are we referring to? Um, and is it the type of progress that is meaningful in terms of our experiences um, as black members of British society? Sorry, that's a sort of... Uh, side, I suppose a sort of bonus question, if you like, but yeah. That's... When I say there's progress, that's based on the people who haven't got a clue what's going on. This is what people say. Me, I see it as a regress, because again, we are not doing our own. We're still picking up a mass of crumbs and scraping and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. All of a sudden now we get a cake and like, you know, we don't, we're not asking what's in it. If this is on the back of Black Lives Matter. It's not because they wanted to. Like I said, you know, like, like um, Charlie said, Saints have been around, have been around for 100, uh, over 100 years. Where were the black faces? You know, we've been, especially in, in London, you know, every time you go to Saints, it's full of people from India and Africa and uh, all over the world. But they didn't advertise us then. It's only no. this year. No. Yeah. And another interesting point that somebody on social media made actually was that, you know, there have been several representations 
um, throughout the years um, in the advertising, uh, whether it be a dragon or other um, animations um, that people, um, you know, Caucasians member of the of society seem to be less aggrieved by. Um, but yet when they see a, a black family, still part of the actual, um, you know, human species, then they're in arms, you know, then there's an, uh, uh, an outcry, you know, and a sense yeah. of outrage because they can't relate to a black family, you know, and I think um, it's a very um, key point actually in terms of um, where this sort of um, racism is, is taking us um, as a society. I think if you're comfortable to relate to um, animations such as Kevin Carrot and um, uh, you know the, the dragon that was used in the in the last advert uh, that they ran, but you're not comfortable seeing another human being. You're unable to relate to another human being. You then it, it, essentially what you're saying is that those human beings cease to be human in your eyes. That yeah. you don't have a level of um, you you don't recognize them with the same level of humanity that you do um, your um, white peers. You know. So, um, um, Chalice, you, you, you had um, a, another point to make. Yeah, and, and just for everyone to add to that, I just think that what we also have to recognise as black people is that being involved in these adverts only further basically supports to uh, enrich the pockets of the individuals who we are representing. There is nothing there that we get from it apart from just being part of their system. So yeah. we have to recognize that the system in itself, even though it brings us in and it takes us out at different times, there is no benefit for us because that system belongs to them unless we are basically benefiting from, from it. And right now we're not. And that's evident. You know, the, the inequalities, uh, you know, the disparities uh, socially um, still prevail. And we all know that, you know, and this has been a, a constant you know, from, from right from uh, Windrush um, arrivals to, 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 to where we are now. Uh, yeah. So we know that these inequalities still exist. So really, if we were to try and actually measure the level of progress that has been made, I think we need to um, maybe at the same time try and understand how racism has been rebranded over the years, what it looks like and what um, the ideas around equality, justice, um, look like also. So are we right to take a suspicious view of a system that has historically failed our community in areas of employment, education, health and housing, you know, that now appears to be embracing Black community. So I direct that to you, um, Brother Chalice. Are we right to be suspicious? Are we right? Yes, I, I believe we're right, only because we live in a capitalistic society. So therefore, if you're taking an interest in me, it's either you want to sell me something or I'm the product. So from my perspective, I'll always be cautious because I'm ignored un until it's beneficial yeah. to you. So therefore, yeah, I believe we should always be cautious. We should always basically be thinking what is in it for them because they always make out that just being inclusive is enough for us, but no, we want more. We should always ask for more. If you look at any, any other culture, if you look at all the other cultures, you look at their platforms of what they do have, their attitude isn't to be inclusive. They will have their movies in their own languages and then they will create subtitles for anyone else who wants to see it. Yeah. That's very yeah, true. That's very true. Look, at the movie Pariah, look at the movie Parasite. It won an Oscar. Mm. It wasn't in English. Yeah. And they, because they didn't care, they said, you take it as we give it to you. Why can't we adapt that? Why can't we be like that? Everything that we do, we want to basically make sure that it's inclusive and it's open to everybody else to come in. So no, I, I personally will always take that stance. And I think a key message from what you're saying as well is that, you know, the um, personal pride that a community takes in their identity uh, is not um, necessarily to, um, it's not necessarily to uh, sort of be um, in, in complete opposition, you know, to um, the idea of 
uh, another race, you know, having their, their, their own um, ability and their own um, uh, desires, you know, to, to thrive and, and survive. So I think my, my, what I'm trying to say is that the advancement of, of, the, of our community is not necessarily um, a case of us trying to um, belittle or diminish what anyone else is doing in their communities. So it's, it's, it's not either or, you know, it's not either or. I think you can um, be um, self-sufficient self and, and, and concerned with your own community's progress um, without having to be hateful or um, demonstrate animosity uh, to another um, racial group. You know, it's not it's it's not either or. But I I think that majority of people in our community they don't sort of. Act. How do we get the majority of people in our community to sort of think that way? Because we're still a lot of people are thinking about being inclusive, being included. So how do we sort of start working towards standing alone, being self sufficient? So I, I direct that to you, Brother Nia. How do we, what's the sort of groundwork, the foundation? How can we sort of start looking at self-sufficiency? <laughs> when, <clears throat> when we start feeding ourselves, when we start housing ourselves, when we start healing ourselves, when we start providing our own security, when all our basic needs are met by ourselves, that's when people will start waking up saying, yeah, we can do this for ourselves. You know, I mean, I think probably this sudden influx of black adverts is on the back of um, um, by black campaigns and the, the black pound, the sudden reason, that, oh, look, there's a possibility that, you know, black people might start buying their own stuff and stop shopping with us. There's a sudden influx of black business directories coming out all of a sudden. Yeah. Probably, probably also on the back of Black Lives Matter as well. But this sudden thought that they're going to start losing the, the black pound, they suddenly wake up. I saw an advert on YouTube for, by Thames Water of a, a, a black man advertising Thames Water. I'm thinking to myself, are these angry people going to stop using water? <laughs> another, <laughs> another thing to boycott. I mean, some don't wash anyway, but there you go. There's another excuse. But I mean, a, a, a classic example is um, I used to have a Chinese neighbour, an uh, old man in his, in his uh, 70s. Now, he, he and his wife, they don't speak a word of English. They've been here for 45 years. Their daughter told me they've been here for 45 years. They don't speak a word of English. They don't go to Sainsbury's or Tesco. They don't, but everything in the community, in a Chinese community, is met. Everything, everything they need for themselves in their community, they've got. They don't need to integrate with anybody else. They don't need to speak English. And then one time this guy, you know, I always say hello to him and they all go, ah, yeah, yeah, and then whatever, and touch my hair and whatever. And they never said, it, never talked to me in English, but I always say, hi, how are you, whatever. One day in particular, the old man comes up to me and goes, why is it that you black people always let other people teach you? Mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, I'm a wonderful, I didn't even speak, I didn't think you could speak English. <laughs> but he's been watching what I do all this time. He's been watching what I do with the Saturday schools. Yeah. Amazing. But like I said, they don't have to do anything outside their community because everything is met. And our people start waking up when we all get involved in actually providing everything we need for ourselves. So that is self-sufficiency. Yeah. yeah. You have to go outside your community for nothing. Just lead, um, as you mentioned, the sort of Black Pound Day campaign, do you see that, do you think that's going to be a consistent sort of fixture within our lives now? Do you think that people are taking it seriously and do you think it will remain for, till the end of time? Like, how I mean, what do you think of the Black Pound Day campaign? And I, um, I'll ask you, Brother Chalice, what do you think about the Black Pound campaign? I do believe the, 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 com the campaign will be around for a while because there's a lot of eyes watching it. And at the end of the day as well, there are a lot of people that are, a lot of businesses have been created because of it. And I think right now they owe it to the community to stick around, to show that they're just not a flash, not just a, an idea that has basically just come about and will disappear in a year's time. And I don't see why it cannot be uh, something that will be there for generations to, become, to, to come because it depends on us. This is not an organization that is basically benefiting 
from uh, the, uh, the whole Black Pound a symbol or basically the movement. It's basically putting it back to us to say, you know what? We're creating a day that just, we're starting with a day and hopefully the attitude will change to a week and then from a week to a, a month and from a month to a year, from a year to a decade, from a decade to a century. And then from there, it becomes habitual. It becomes part of what we are, what we have been as Africans from day one. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we've lost that because of history. We've lost what we, and it's beautiful when you see uh, ideas like this coming into fruition and it will manifest, it definitely will work because we, we are buying into it. I think I think you make a really interesting point there, um, Chalice, uh, around um, what what obviously um, Sherelle's referred to as a campaign. But what I'd like to see is a, a value system being developed um, within our community. Um, your point is effectively that part of the solution in terms of what change really looks like, in terms of realizing that self sufficiency that it has to be incremental, it has to be um, step by step. Um, and yeah. I think that is um, key to every area that we're looking to actually make gains and progress um, within, that it needs to be incremental. And, and, and key to that as well is that um, SWIFT is the one that actually started this campaign, um, stroke value system that is now being developed within our community. Um, and, and what that tells me is that there should actually be some clear leadership, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that if we are actually to redefine ourselves as a community, you know, that leaders must emerge inevitably. And I think that it's a pattern that you see throughout the cross section of society uh, within the various racial groups, that there is a strong sense of leadership. So um, Brother Nia, do you have any comments um, on that point? I, I, I hear what you, you're saying about have, having a leadership to lead us to start buying from our own. But quite frankly, we don't, we don't need leadership. We, we've, we've got enough evidence in our face to show us that we need to be supporting our own. You know, because all, all these angry European people about being angry about having black people on adverts, they didn't have a leader saying, stop, don't go to Sainsbury's. Mm. They just said, look, oh, I'm boycotting it. I'm, I'm just getting on with it. They just do it. What we need is discipline in everything that we do in our community. If you're, if you're saying where you want to buy black, have the discipline to do so. Because I, 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 you know, I've always been down to um, a, a restaurant in, in, um, a Brixton, in Brixton. I've passed a, a, a Brazilian restaurant. And I know the person that says, hi, hi, how are you? Look at that. You're, this is bef you know, before, all the, before this year. And I said, look, your restaurant's packed. You know, all the, everything around here is empty, but your restaurant is packed. Because, yeah, because like pe Brazilian people from all over London come to this place because there's not many places that sell Brazilian food. So, certain communities are prepared to travel distances to support their own businesses and get their own. We don't do that. I think I, travel, just... I'm, I live in Westminster. I, I, live, I used to travel all the way down to Norwood to the only black fishmonger that I knew to go and buy, buy fish. Back, they, back when I used to eat fish, I'm trying not to eat, I'm trying to be vegan now, but I used to travel all that distance just to find a black fishmonger. But we I don't wanna, have I wanna, that I want to quickly go to the chat um, and just to sort of um, raise some of the interesting comments that are coming up on the chat. So um, I'll refer to Sabri Sabira. Yeah. Um, I agree with self-sufficiency and the way to do that is teaching our children ourselves and helping and feeding ourselves and providing support for ourselves, uh, supporting our own organizations and people and shops. Um, and then we've got another comment from Rudy. Um, agree, Brenda. If we are focused on community building, we won't have time to hate on others. We're too welcoming of others as is. Did you want to take um, another one? Um, Got Dawn. So I think it's, it's uh, Brenda. So I, I don't think we need to be concerned with how we feel about other communities. The focus needs to be on our own community, no wasting of energy or attention. Okay, yeah, well, that's a few, great. And um, quite a few coming through. And I think that leads us nicely on to um, the next uh, section, 
where we're looking at um, identity um, crisis and self-discovery through education. So if I may, I'll, I'll start with the first question and I'll direct that to um, Chalice. Uh, so is an Afrocentric education enough to change our experience as black members of British society? No, I don't think it's enough. I think it's a great start. But uh, what I do believe, I, I, why I say I think it is a great start, it allows us to basically recognize the values and identify with our ancestors, which then in, in turn basically increases our self-esteem and pride. However, what I do believe we also need to be looking at politics and the way basically politics works and the system works and how it oppresses us. So what I'm saying in terms of the Afrocentric education, it goes part of the way to basically develop us as people, to bring us back to the way we were as individuals and keep us in tune with how we should be functioning as brothers and sisters in the community. But we, we definitely need to also be looking at the political realm because that's where the power is, politics and economics, and we can't leave that out of it. Okay, thank you. And um, uh, Brother Nia? Yeah, I just want to say like, nothing that's being said here is about hate. We're not hating on anybody. We're just bigging up ourselves. There's nothing wrong with that, there's no hate. It's just bigging up our own. So when we're dealing with our own education, we're just trying to big up ourselves and big up our own children. You know, filling that void that is missing from what is provided but to us by the government or other, 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 other communities. It's not hating them, which is realizing we need to do something for ourselves. So yeah, learning our um, African history and culture is a foundation that yeah. all our children should be having a foundation to lead on to other areas of people activity whether it's politics, whether it's law, whether it's defense, whether it's um, economics and you know, further education. It's a base that we all need. And the, the, the children that have that base and the ones that don't, you see a significant difference in their outlook throughout life. Yeah. Okay, um, I think we'll move on quickly. Um, there are some, some follow on questions, but let, let's move on just because of time. Um, what role do you think um, education should play in this transformation uh, for our community? So what role do you see it take, uh, uh, taking um, in, in terms of this change that we're trying to realize? Like I'll say, yeah, I'll, I'll ask them, yeah. Once, we've, once we've learned certain things, because like this, when we start educating, educating ourselves, it just totally reevaluates how you see yourself and reevaluate re how you see the rest of the world. So you take that education forward, and you, you know, and you bring you bring it forward in, in your community. So, in, you know, in, in schools, you know, a classic example is that you know I wasn't taught there was any black people in the first or second European tribal wars, aka world wars. But now I see that you know, I was always told, oh, we didn't fight in this country for you lot to come over here. But now I'm, reason I'm seeing that there's like millions of us fighting in this European tribal war. So we have a right to be here and we have the right to put, put our foot down in here. You can't tell us to go elsewhere. Basically, your war was about fighting over our resources in the first place. But when you realise that and understand that, take it forward to other areas of our activity. Use it as a foundation. But we have to control our own education for ourselves. We can't be taking crumbs from other people and understand other cultures from our perspective. It's the hunter and the hunted. So, so what are the risks associated with not creating the time to educate our children and more to the point ourselves? And I'll direct that to um, Brother Chalice. Well, um, a few of the risks are that, uh, just to follow on from what Brother Nia said, is that when we're following a Eurocentric uh, curriculum, they create the narrative and the trajectory which then basically means that in that narrative and that trajectory, we're pretty much invisible. And let's be real, the Brits have a sense of pride based upon history. So where does our pride come into it if we don't have history? If we can't recognize where we're from? The, the saddest part for me when, I'm looking at, when I look at Black History Month is that 
I feel it doesn't go far back enough. I yeah. think it starts from a particular place of when we were oppressed. It doesn't talk, it doesn't go far back for when we, when we were great, when we were doing things, when when we basically governed three quarters of the world, or when we how our teachings were instrumental in what they know now. And our young people, our young children cannot garner a sense of pride if they don't know about this, because all they're seeing is oppressed people fighting a system and getting battered. So for me personally, I think when we're looking at religion and um, when we're looking at education, it needs to be embraced religiously. And we need to basically make sure there's some repetition there for our young people because the powers that be out there, they deal with repetition by the media, which we know at the end of the day, we're not in a position to compete with that. So it means we have to get down hard, do all the grassroots work, be working with organizations like, like uh, Brother Nia, like uh, the Black Agenda. There are all these people out there that want to give us a voice, that want to do the work with us. And we need to be connecting with those people because at this moment, the narrative is created by people that at the end they it's where we're invisible. I think I think even what we were saying is about time though. As parents, how do we as parents um sort of make the time, if you know what I mean? How can we sort of make it a, a sort of a, make it so that it's not something that we can fit in? with our day-to-day -day sort of routine so that we're not sort of lacking, you know, that we're not, we're not sort of, we're sort of a day-to-day -day sort of routine that is within, you know, for our children. How do we, what's your sort of um, ideas of how we can create time as parents? And I'll um, address that to brother Nia. Somebody has um, just put up the two words that I only want to talk about time and money now if a parent wants to go watch eastenders they will make that time free you know, everything's done and you everything's out of the way and you can sit down and watch your favorite tv program so have that same discipline when it comes to educating your children and if you don't have the time use your finance to send your children to a saturday school or after school after school club yes time and money and we've all got it <laughs> That's really I think that leads on to the next question. Um, Brother Nia, you obviously work very closely um, with the supplementary, black supplementary schools um, within the UK. Um, and it would be great, I think, for, for those who are actually um, present on the, on the meeting uh, to understand. Um, because I know that it has been a consideration that has, um, you know, with the uh, sort of uh, advent of, of the whole Black Lives Matter and the sort of black consciousness um, being uh, sort of reared um, within the minds of, of the black British community, um, people are starting to think and um, are actually taking those decisive steps to get their children into supplementary school and have started making inquiries. Um, in the last edition, we spoke with um, uh, Simon David, um, uh, David Simon of, uh, of Simon Education, uh, who is a, um, uh, who ha has an online education platform for the black community. Um, and he actually um, stated that there has been a significant increase in the number of inquiries coming through. So yeah. can you give, um, for, for the benefit of those who are actually thinking or going through that thought process, you know, what, what should be the starting point in terms of the selection criteria? What should people be thinking about when um, finding or identifying a suitable supplementary school, black supplementary school for their child or children? Starting point, using the NEBS directory. <laughs> Go to the next website and yeah. use that directory. <laughs> the whole list of African heritage supplementary schools all over the country. And even there's one particular brother, he's got African centered supplementary schools all over the world. They've got 14 all over the world. I got a phone call from a sister in Australia and I was able to con link up with the Kwame Nkrumah Heritage Academy who have got them dotted around in Italy, Ireland, 
France, America, and, and Australia. So I linked up with a satellite school in Australia, which is 300 miles away, but in Australia, that's like around the corner. <laughs> but in saying, in saying that, I mean, like, because of the lockdown, we, this is 2020 now, and we're in the middle of a, a scandemic, pandemic lockdown. So a lot of the schools have had to close. On the back of that, we've kind of benefited because the supplementary schools have gone online. Yeah. Now the issue with parents before was, oh, I haven't got time, or I got, they want to get the children out of bed on a Saturday morning, or I've got to take them to football, or got to take, you know, some excuse not to use a Saturday school. Now there's no excuse. It's on your child's phone, it's on your laptop, it's on your tablet, it's in your yard. And th there has been a massive influx of, of um, parents looking for supplementary schools, and the supplementary schools are, have adapted now to modern technology, because well, basically because they've had to, yeah. to go online. And it's working. It's absolutely working. And what should they? What should parents be looking for? You know, if they're looking to make the best choice for their children, of course. And 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 ultimately, what we're trying to do here is to really sort of um, tease out, you know, uh, the the points of action, i.e., the the enabling. Um, points that will allow people to then make conscious decisions towards this self-sufficiency that we keep talking about. What should they be looking for when um, shortlisting or selecting um, a supplementary school? Um, I, the, I, even, even though they're online, a lot of them are online, I will always say choose your local supplementary school because they do actually link up with the local um, mainstream schools in your area. So, you know, you stick to your local area. There's always schools in your local area. If you can't find one, then contact me. But stick to the supplementary school in your local area so they can link up with your mainstream school and, and, it, and, and that way your child can get the, um, the help from both sides of the spectrum. So stick to your local area. Then, obviously, you can speak to the, the um, people who run the schools and find out what, they, what their emphasis is. Some might be a homework uh, club. Some might be uh, have an emphasis on science. Um, uh, you know, some of them... I've got um, a mentors, some do um, out, out, um, out, um, trips and stuff like that. So they've all got different uh, aspects. They, they all deal with this basic science, maths, and English. Um, but okay. you know, I would highly recommend choosing one that, that has African history within either within the lessons or a separate lesson. I think most of them do actually incorporate African history and culture within individual lessons if they don't have that as a separate uh, lesson. Well, your, your history and your culture and interaction with your mainstream, mainstream school. That's a, that's a good point to look and, into. And I know that your children attended supplementary school and I'd like to get a sense of what a typical day um, looked like for them when, when they were at, at supplementary school, if you would. Yeah, I mean, my, my children, they went um, to supplementary schools, you know, 15 years ago. So it was a while ago. I mean, I've done plenty of interviews with supplementary schools uh, um, I've done three in a week this week, so you can see those videos and see what's going on currently. But um, typical days, you know, they come in, they'll have an assembly, they'll have a prayer, or uh, um, talk about what they have, for, what they've done for the day. Then they'll go, they break out into um, different classes, either different age groups if they can, or just in different um, lessons. So they'll do their science, maths, and English, and, and African history, and um, they will, they will, depending on the school and what resources they have and what space they have. They will do, do um, other other things. They might do sports. They might do like, go on a trip. But you know, but they they'll break out and do individual lessons, and then at the end they'll come together. But it's it's pretty intense stuff. It's very good. Um, some schools will also incorporate the children's homework as well. They you know they all do very much different things. But they, it's it's packed. There's a lot of stuff packed in, and they'll get homework. And the good thing about also is that you know um, a lot of the supplement schools they encourage the parents to stay or at least a couple of times to, to stay in, which is highly recommended. Number one, you need to see what your children are learning. And also, a lot of parents are not particularly engaged with the mainstream schools, but you can get an update as to what your children are learning from the, the Saturday schools, because they, they, they'll incorporate the, the, the curriculum as well as what they're doing as well. And, you know, I highly recommend that parents will stay. And also with the online uh, schools now, the parents are actually watching what the children are learning. And so the, 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 the parents are learning a lot. Home educators as well are using supplementary schools as an addition to um, teaching their children at home. So there's so much going on in the schools. You need to see those videos and then just see what they're going on, going through, because it's literally a full-time job just running a four-hour site of school. Okay. I, think, I think a very important point there, um, Brother Nia, is, is the actual benefit to the parents as well, because I think 
um, there is a gap. There is a huge gap. Um, I think, um, you know, in, in terms of my generation, at least I can say that um, I wasn't, you know, fortunate enough, um, privileged enough to, to attend a supplementary school. And I think um, there's a lot of um, important um, uh, elements of our identity uh, that, as um, Chalice was saying, that can actually be developed um, and cultivated and, and, and personal um, uh, sense, of, sense pride. of pride, pride that comes yeah. from, uh, you know, understanding our history that, that predates slavery. So again, um, very, very important. Um, let's move on now to the final section, um, which is uh, practical fundamentals. And I think it's really just um, about understanding, uh, you know, what are some of the cultural ethics, the values um, and um, uh, I ideologies really that we need to adopt as a group. I think um, one thing that I will say that is quite um, distinct with uh, the black community is um, we are um, obviously very uh, vast and um, uh, fragmented mm. uh, quite quite um, ostensibly, um, you know, within the UK. And I know that that's one thing that has obviously thwarted our progress for, for some time. Um, but I want to um, ask the very first question um, to uh, Chalice, which is that um, values. values and um, group economics are just a few of the fundamental areas that need to be collectively adopted if we are to move forward. Uh, so um, with our unique history um, as a people um, and the fragmented nature of our racial group, is this possible? Absolutely. I think with hard work and determination, and most importantly, understanding of the system it is possible. In order for you to basically uh, manoeuvre within the system, you have to understand the system of oppression. If you don't understand it, then you will always be in conflict with the system. So what I'm trying to say is that for us as people, we've always been at the forefront of tr tried and tested ideologies. So we recognise this. And we've always gone about doing what needs to be done, but the one Achilles heel that we do have, and I keep saying it, is integration and the attitude of basically inclusion. And through that, this is how we often are undone because what it is, we, we, we allow others to come in and dictate how we basically conduct our business. And maybe they have a hand in it with money or whatever, but because of these things at the end of the day, it makes it hard, harder for us to move forward, but it's, it can be done if we have, if we adapt that attitude of self-reliance and the evidence has been there. We've seen it. Marcus Garvey done it. Mm. Nation of Islam done it. Whether you like them or not, they've done it. NABS is now a perfect example of, a, of, of an organization doing it, doing it for themselves. So it can be done, but it's about hard work, determination, and recognizing where we stand within the system. Mm. Brother Nia? Yeah, we, we keep on talking about our community being fragmented. All communities are fragmented. Now, I, I, you know, I'm based around Edge of Road where the Arabs have got this on lockdown. They're fragmented. But what, you know, the Europeans are fragmented. You can just watch the, the, the uh, Prime Minister's question time, say how they argue amongst each other, whatever. All communities are fragmented, but what the other communities do is come together on a common cause. And common that's where we cause. need discipline. I keep on using I keep on using that word. We need that discipline to come together on what we do agree on. For we're forever talking about what we don't agree on, which is fine. But, we, but then we need that discipline to come together on what we do agree on. And we agree that we need our own economics. We agree that we need our own schools. We agree we need our own hospitals and clinics. We agree we need our own mental health institutions. We agree. So get on with it. Have the discipline and get on with it. But see, get up uh, talking and get, and get into the action. It's so true. So, um, I mean, give us some basic ideas of how we as a people and begin to organize and operate as a community as community activists, let's say. Like, how do we how do we go about what's the starting, what's the building blocks? And I'll address that to Ravania. Just building blocks. From what you're saying. Building blocks. I mean, it helps if you have the basic information to, to do what you need to do. You know, if you want to 
um, build uh, build a, a business in, you know, say if you want to build a business in selling bulb light bulbs, you do the groundwork and find out about light bulbs, what types of light bulbs you've got, where the supplies of light bulbs come from, how much they cost, how what, what storage. You do that homework in finding out the information to do what you need to do. So yeah, do the research. Research is out there. Ask questions. Find people who think the same as you, and get on with it. Set the business up. Yeah. You know, and then, like I said, time and finance. If you don't have the time, finance those who do. Yeah. Uh, Chalice, yes, please go ahead. I think also we need to include in their trust because uh, there is a lot of distrust amongst ourselves when we when we're trying to create platforms in order for growth and development and as a people we need to basically be giving some giving our our own people chances to to get it right we sometimes are quick to just shun our people if they get it wrong and and i've seen it time after time in 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 the basic form of if i go into a shop and the customer service is poor you write that shop off because of that one person and it's unfortunate because that shop only hired a person that they thought was probably fit for the role. And that person now has made you probably written off that shop. And in the process, you may have written off a lot of other black shops because we often generalize. So I believe that as, as individuals, we need to basically be more trusting and have a little bit more faith in individuals who do stand up or who, may, who, who are brave enough to basically try and lead and, and offer that support that strength, get behind them. Because at the end of the day, we've, we've got behind other people and look where we are right now. So we need to get behind people who are basically making that concerted effort to try and do something. Give them the chance, give them the opportunity. That's a, that's a huge topic in itself in terms of building the trust. Um, Brother Nia, if you wanted to go ahead. Yeah, I, I saw somebody else mention the word customer service in there and it's, yeah, it's, it's, it is an issue but in saying that we're so quick to jump on the negative customer service we get and and throw it all over social media and tell everybody but we're not so quick to say when we've had excellent customer service mm. you know let's share good news as well as because we love drama too much let's get into the habit of sharing some good news because when you actually think about it it outweighs the bad news significantly Let's just get away from the drama and get into the habit of sharing some good news because there's so much of it. Yeah. Transgenerational yeah. trauma plays a big part in all of that. Absolutely. And that's why I said it's a, it's a whole nother topic of it in its own right, which we can't that's go into today. Yeah. But very quickly, I want to again go to the chat just to bring in um, our participants. Um, so um, we've got a comment from Darren uh, yeah, Bryan, yeah. Uh, the first building block. Egos, egos left, left at, at the, the door, door. Um, <laughs> and, and 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 brother Nia is nodding like vigorously in, in agreement with you there, um, Darren. So um, absolutely, and I think we all recognise that um, within our community. Okay, we've got uh, another comment from uh, Sabira. Um, did you want to take that, Sherelle? The, the bottom one. I would rather have my own people deal with me away than any other races in a shop situation. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. Yeah, and just great. a reminder Thanks, that we've got a um a Q and A uh, that's coming up shortly. So if you do have any questions, uh, just in the interest of time, perhaps to just post them in the chat so that we can actually collate them and 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 try and get in as many as we can. Okay. Um. So I think we have um tackled that section pretty much. I think there's one more. Okay. So there's there's one more question. Um, that I think we should um, ask on this particular Same. one, which is, um, what are the... What are some things we can yeah. do as a community to keep the momentum of driving change? So I'll say that again. What are some things we can do as a community to keep the momentum of driving change? And I'll address that to Brother Chalice. Okay. Uh, collaboration, firstly, I think we, we need to collaborate more, recognize when individuals are out there putting in the work and recognize if they're better suited to deliver whatever project it is and collaborate with them. 
no point in reinventing the wheel if it's there because we have a lot of organizations out here doing a lot of the same thing and i think that at the end of the day, if we all come together there's unity and strength no point in being oversaturated uh what else we're looking at instilling values because values basically it's kind of like a set of principles that you hold dear to yourself we have 15 that we we basically have instilled within the organization that we we kind of try and share with any individuals that come into contact with us i'll gladly share them with you so that you could share them with the participants of the group and if they take some uh, reverence from that or something from that that's a beautiful thing but i do believe that at the end of the day we need to have these mandates in place that will govern us and 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 galvanize us to do the right things but collaboration definitely when you can find an organization with a common goal support it get involved like today you i've, I'm, I've now know i know about brother near and nabs and whatnot i had ideas of looking at schools i'm not doing that he's best suited for that i would link with him and basically move forward and come with my ideas and hope we can implement something together and move forward because it's for the betterment of our people. Yeah. And Brother Nia? Yeah, I, like I said, I, I've had an influx of people wanting to be um, attend supplementary schools and also an influx of people who want to set up their own supplementary schools. And every single time, the first thing I always say to them is, is there an existing school that you can join and help build up rather than reinvent the wheel? First thing I always say, we we have got far too many organisations in different areas, whether it's education, health, mental health, or business or whatever. We've got far too many organisations doing the same thing. And like Brother Chalice is, if you really need to set up your own, at least collaborate with existing organisations, because no man is an island. You can't do this by yourself. And I understand the passion that you want to get things done. You want to get things done, but if you've got no experience in the field, Go on, join something that's already there. Yeah. Support what already exists. We've got far too many people doing the same thing, and it just fragments the resources, the limited resources that we have. Absolutely. But keep yeah. that energy going. You know, on the back of Black Lives Matter, keep that energy going. Keep researching um, um, information. Keep doing. Keep doing it. Just because it's not in the news, just because it's not all over the BBC and CNN, doesn't mean you have to stop. No. Nah, keep the energy going. Keep that fire burning. Yeah, absolutely. Let me just very quickly bring in a point from um, Darren um, again. Uh, and it says, uh, speak that truth, Brother Chalice. Uh, one, governance. Two, compliance. Three, ideology. And four, understand that no one is bigger than the end goal, um, which is um, a very, very important point, uh, that the vision is far greater than any ego or any individual interests. So um, uh, yeah, just wanted to pull that in quickly before we move on. Right, so okay, um, nice. what we will very quickly do, we've got one, one more question that we just wanted to, because it is very timely, um, so it is uh, sort of current affairs, as, as most of it is. Yeah. Um, so um, evidence from the Stephen Lawrence Review, commissioned by uh, the leader of the opposition um, and uh, the mayor's office, sets out that the impact of COVID-19 on the BAME community um, has obviously been harrowing. So it's been a very, very devastating, had a devastating impact on our community. Um, the government and its scientific advisor group um, are eagerly pushing the BAME community uh, to the front of the vaccination queue. Will you be in that queue, Brother <laughs> Nia? <laughs> What's your thoughts? Will you be in that queue? Am I allowed to swear? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> no. No, no. I, I don't. I don't. I, I don't. I don't get. I don't. You know what? I just don't believe this. Uh, and stop using Bane, please. I mean, yeah. we're not, no, 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 no. That's, that's, the, that's the official. That's, that's, the that's not my language. Yeah, we just use our own language. <laughs> but, but let me say this though. Let me say yeah. this. I, I understand there's a um, disease out there, and there's, and there's people dying. The numbers are debatable, but me personally. The people that I know that have been said, there's been six people that I know have been said to have died of COVID. They have had no symptoms mm. at all. They've already had um, cancer and heart disease or asthma. 
But the, what, has, what has been said, they've actually, the hospitals say they've caught it in the hospital. Now, one particular uh, sister, she had um, diabetes. She was in the 60s. She went in, so as far as I hear, she went into hospital for a checkup. She, she had no symptoms. All of a sudden now, the hospital said, oh, you've got COVID. Put, on a, put her on a respirator. Bearing in mind, she had no symptoms. She was able to walk around by herself. 24 hours, she's dead. No way. Because yeah. even, even if she did have COVID, it doesn't kill you in 24 hours. Yeah. And, also, and there's numerous families that I know about, not naming names, but they are numerous families that are taking the NHS to court because they know full well that their family member did not have any symptoms like that, not even a cold or flu, and yeah. next minute they're dead. No, and not go so. And I know nurses and doctors personally who have come to me and said, "Listen, Neil, da 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 da, it's a guan." And a brother, and a brother I know who works in a mortuary. He told me that he, they've been told just to add COVID on their uh, on their death certificates or on, on their death plates. They've been told to just add it on, regardless of what they died of. And he spoke to two other people that he knows in works in mortuaries around the country, and they've all been told the same thing. Don't add up for me. Brother Chalice? It's an unequivocal no for me. With, uh, I, I believe that from... I'm not a scientist, but what I do know about vaccines, what I have read about them, I think that are you not injected with the symptom in order for you to, for them to then cure it or something like that? So if that's the case, I'm not taking the chance. I've, uh, I've basically, I'm doing all right out here, but if we're talking about them always looking at us first, there's an agenda there, isn't there? Yeah. We, we know there's an agenda. And I think it's because we often don't scream the loudest. We're always willing to accept anything that seems to be free or coming from the powers that be. Whereas you try and give it to other people, they will question it. They will ask questions. They will want evidence. They will want to see loads of information to, that would suggest that this vaccination is what it is. Unfortunately for us, we sometimes basically don't do ourselves any favors. We're quick to believe the propaganda, we're quick to believe the media, we're quick to believe officials. And, and often a lot of that is the older generation. I would make, I would, I'll, I'll put that out there, it's the older generation. And so this is probably why they're doing what they're doing. So, but for me now, nah, I'm not interested. I barely <laughs> The, um, chat the chat is, is going out. <laughs> Um, I think I think it's a sort of a unanimous uh, verdict no, on this. So no, um, no. yeah, um, and and as we are referring to the chat, I think um, we'll We're very swiftly go. move on um, and open up uh, the Q and A now. Um, yes, just yes. to um, reiterate uh, the, the house protocol. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly protocol. around the the Q and A. So to um, to all the participants, if you'd like to ask uh, the panelists any questions please raise your hand in the chat tools. And if you can, please um, sort of uh, put your camera on so we can sort of see you. Yeah, um, ideally. 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 If not, ideally. If not yeah, don't no, 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 no issue. We're so, not going to make a big thing of it. Um, so if you, so I think we have a question. Is that from Indiana? Indiana Jonesy. Indiana. Yeah. <laughs> so... Okay, so um, Indiana um, Jones, are you able to unmute? Yeah, I don't think she's. Okay, so. Are you able to unmute him from there? Yeah. Okay, whilst we're trying to resolve, whilst we're trying to resolve the um, issue with them, um, Okay, well, um, um, okay. So, so Indiana, Indiana um, if you can unmute yourself and we'll take your question. Uh, but if not, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, Indiana, do you have a question? Can we? Do you no. have a question? No. 
Okay. Okay. Um, if, if you wanted to, you can actually type it in the chat. If you did want to um, ask your question, if it was very pressing, uh, feel free to, to type yeah, it in the chat. Free, yeah, to use the chat. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I've got a question um, because I think everyone else is. Um, I can't see that there are any other questions uh, so far. Um, perhaps some will emerge, but I've got a question and that question is about um, uh, kind of back to the BLM uh, conversation. So where we started at the very beginning. Now, obviously um, you both made reference to the fact that BLM has had um, an impact and has made some change. Um, but you also in the same breath mentioned that um, perhaps uh, the agenda um, that, that BLM is, uh, you know, promoting or um, uh, presenting uh, may not necessarily be um, strictly in the in the interests of, of our community. So apart from uh, BLM then, um, who has um, clearly had a massive um, impact, um, you know, socially um, and in the media space, um, how else do we get our voices heard um, to enable us to, I suppose, enact the, the, the changes that we want to see. And, I, and I'll ask Brother Nia to start on that. How do we get our voices heard? <clears throat> well, I mean, there's, there's numerous um, initiatives being put forward. We've got our own Black Search Engine UK coming out. Uh, we've always had um, Blacknet have always been around. They've always been, we've got some Black chat rooms coming forward. So using our, our own um, entities to discuss amongst ourselves, they're there, use them. Use our own social media networks, our own social media organizations, use our own. You, you know, I know mean, Facebook's out there and everybody wants to use that, but also just use our own. C connect with our, uh, ourselves and use our own entities and just build our own. But again, discipline. Brother Chalice, do you have anything to add? I concur with uh, what Brother Nia is saying because I think right now social media is a tool that we can basically access and and I think a lot of people are doing it when via podcasts and and linking up with other organizations however like I said it's about collaborative working if you see somebody out there doing their bit try and reach out to those individuals and try and to try and get on those platforms so that you can basically be spreading the message far and wide. I know a lot of people out here are probably not inclined to allow you on their platform, but that's the attitude we kind of need to really change. Because if we're trying to basically address an issue that has been systemic, that's been there, that's kind of oppressed us for years, we have to recognize that at the end of the day, we can only do that by helping each other, supporting each other, uplifting each other. So. I think it's about us tackling it via social media, linking with individuals who, were, who are educated within the field of uh, black economics, black history, go to universities and speak to some of these black credible uh, professors. All these individuals, I believe, are, are ways we can get the message out there and, and basically garner some kind of uh, support to, around the course. That's Great, good. thank you. I think we have a question. Um, is that from Max? Indeed, that's me. Um, I have a question to the panelists, those Charles and Brother Nair. Greetings to you, brothers and sisters. Greetings. Greetings. My question is what does Black empowerment, Black freedom, Black success, African success look like? That's the Charles and to Brother Nair. In other words, there has to be the aspiration. What does that aspiration look like? Is my question to both of you. I I'll think start, that's I'll a very go for it. Yeah. What it looks like is when your children can go to our own schools, be employed by our own people, or start their own businesses, go to our own hospitals, have be secured by our own security services, when all our basic needs are met by our own people. That's what African success means to me. You don't have to go outside your community for nothing. No, not even for food. That's what it means. 
Okay, so in terms of behavioral, if, if I saw this person working on, on the street, what behaviors would they be manifesting? What behaviors would I expect this successful African identified person to manifest in his interaction with other Africans and other peoples like Europeans and Asians? So right. was, I'm saying, what's the model for this person? Because, it, it, okay, I, I, use, I go back to Black Panther. Black Panther was escapism, but people liked it because there's certain things in there that they would like to be like. So what is that model, the ideal African? Okay, so you'll say, okay, schools, um, self-sufficiency, but there also has to be behavioral patterns, behavioral changes that need to occur as well. So if I was going to create a drama to manifest or show these patterns, show this behavior, show the successful black family, the successful black society, you know, those are the things, that's what interests me right now. What is the aspiration? What does the aspiration look like tangibly? Yeah? I see where you're going with this, but it's not going to be perfect. It's never going to be perfect. We're not going to be all kings and queens and like that. It's never going to be like that. We always, all, there's always going to be issues. There's always mental health issues and, and emotional issues. There's always going to be there. It's a case of how we deal with it. Brother Chalice? Do you know what? You pretty much hit the nail on the head when you said about us being able to have our own platforms to do for ourselves. And we're also talking about media having our, our own networks. Because let's be real, when we, looking at, when we look at networks, the TV and whatever that's uh, out there, it doesn't fully represent us. And not only that, it doesn't fully represent us, it basically sends subliminal messages to our young people that will only basically enrich the oppressors. So therefore, even down when we're looking at stuff like music videos, so to speak, those music videos are giving this kind of false idea of riches. But that false idea of riches is basically only the money's going straight back, straight out of your community into European businesses, such as those car companies, the designers, jewelry, so forth, so forth. So what, what I think when you, when you answered the question, I think you pretty much hit the nail on the head. It's about us being able to do for self in every spectrum, in every quadrant, and basically being able to be open to take advice from others, yes, but that advice shouldn't be detrimental to us because we're confident enough to do for ourselves. We're confident enough to basically go into the economic market and people have to be buying from us, just like every other nation. On our terms. So we're going to move so to... Could, could I just add to that as a, a parting comment? <laughs> so the reason I bring that up is, I mean, our youngsters aspire to wear lots of fashions from Europeans. So if the ideal is African aesthetics, African drama, African movies, African poetry. In other words, if we have this aesthetic, this idea of what we should be aspiring to, our fashion, our music, your expression, everything will go in that direction. So that's why I personally focus on what is the aesthetic? What does it look like? What does that goal look like? What's the vision as opposed to the mechanics of where we need to be? Thank you very yeah, much thank for you that, very much. Um, Brother Please. Max. We're going to move on because of time. Um, yeah. And if you wouldn't mind lowering your hand once you have asked your question, yeah. uh, let's move on to Darren, uh, no, we're Brian. Move on one, sorry, yeah, da Darren. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Darren. <laughs> Darren. Thank you, sisters. Evening, family. Greetings, Good. Brother Chalice and Brother Nia. So. Greetings. So my um, question being, <laughs> because this is quite the global phenomenon, we as Africans find ourselves around the globe, do we concentrate solely in the UK or do we try and spread our wings and try and involve those within the diaspora? I think that's a hard question, but it's a brilliant question because UK Africans at this moment in time are in their own bind, they're in their own situation, which they need to do for themselves. And Africa, as we know it, is in its own situation where everyone is pillaging from Africa because of, obviously, I still believe that, that the co colonial 
empire still have their hands in Africa in terms of politics. So that question in itself, basically, I think every country or every place in the world has to recognize that at the end of the day, it's, we're just one people, as in Africans. The whole thing about black sometimes creates division. And in recognizing that we're black people in doing for ourselves here and doing our, for ourselves in America and wherever else in the continent world we may be, I feel that it will also encourage and strengthen the, the motherland. I hope that answers your question. No, it certainly does, brother. And like you said, it's a complex one. Believe me, I wasn't trying to catch you out or anything, but it's nice to know that we're both <laughs> of the same mindset. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, for me, I mean, people say to me, brother, why don't you set up, a, set up a NABS in America or set up a NABS in Africa? I'm like, well, why should I? I'm growing up here in the UK. My children are going to be here in the UK. My focus is on UK. And Africa is a, a minimum of 54 countries. And within those countries, there's numerous separate communities. Like Nigeria is built up with at least about 250 different languages. So we're not necessarily a one people. We are a very diverse people. Mm -hmm. So when you say you want to go to Africa, where? Africa is not a country. Africa is a continent. So where in Africa are you talking about? So I deal with what I know, and that's London, that's UK. I deal with what I know. I don't have connections in other countries, but those who do, more than happy, go, go ahead and go and, and help the diaspora. My focus is UK. That's where I live and that's where my children are. But like I say, we are not a one people. We are an extremely diverse people with a multi multitude of languages and different cultures. And we need to understand that and embrace that. Thank you very much, Ronia. Uh, do you want to? We're going to go to one question um, from the chat. It was from Liz. Um, how can we challenge our businesses in providing better customer service and building trust? And I'll direct that to um, Brother Chalice. Feedback. Instead of coming out and complaining and having a go or, or berating them or publicly flogging them, give feedback. Feedback, usually those individuals who are in there, some, in some cases, there are ma there's a manager above them. And if they're not, there isn't a manager above them and that person is the manager, give the feedback there. Don't just walk out and be disappointed with the service and then basically leave, uh, be giving people bad press about this particular establishment. Give the feedback there and then. Let them know and basically, hopefully that will change. I just believe some of the times we need to give our uh, black organizations and establishments a chance. I feel we're always quick to basically condemn. I'm not saying they're gonna always get it right. We don't know what plight they're going through just to keep that, that building open or that shop open. We don't know what. So some of these people have their own issues and no, they shouldn't be transferring that onto their customers, but everybody has stuff going on for themselves. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we also have one more question from Mike. Yeah, yeah so Mike. we'd like to take a question from um, uh, our uh, support team. Support yeah, team. we've got a support team here yeah. and um, we've got um, Mike. Call me a producer. Our producer. producer. Let's get the technical terms <laughs> correct. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sitting in the background working the controls. Hi, my brothers and sisters out there. Um, it's been a lively debate and it's been been wonderful to listen to. It's uh, it's a passion of mine, and I've, I've taken uh, a couple of few a few notes because I think it's important that we recognise that self validation is everything. Okay, we have to validate ourselves. We are not the system that we as people have been trying to get validated in is not ours. Therefore, it doesn't recognise us. It wasn't built for us. Okay, the the value system is not ours, and that's the first thing that we need to understand. Um, we need to really know who we are. And that's taking time to invest in our history, to celebrate what has gone before. Okay, and to celebrate that in a very, very deep way. We need to stop looking for our greatness and start living our greatness. Because it was always there. We, we, 
slavery is something that happened to us. It didn't define us, right? What went before defined us? And we were, as the gentleman said, we have a rich history. So those are the things that we need to embrace. And, and for now, where I feel very strongly that we've gone wrong as a community in a general sense, is we focused too much on our image and not enough on our character. Yeah. And when we invest in our characters, the world will see who we are and they'll see who we are from an authentic place because it's us and not your version of us. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, thank very you very well much. said. So um, we can thank you all for participating in our meeting today. Um, please follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Um, our social handles will are uh, in be the shortly. should be shared shortly yeah. in the chat box. Um, yeah. So can we, can we can we just um just to make sure that we are we do have some takeaways um with this. Um, I think it's important to to basically just um, ensure that we are able to sort of um uh, have some concrete points of action. Um, and I think um. It's uh, a, a few things have come out and, and emerged from, from our meeting um, this evening. I think for, for those who are um, looking at um, ways to actually get the message out there, it's very clear that um, social media um, is going to be that platform uh, that we need to uh, continue because a number of us are already using that space, but that we need to continue to use to share our message um, and, and to also um, uh, share whatever it is that we're doing in terms of business to promote the community efforts. Um, I think uh, in terms of educating ourselves, um, we said that supplementary schools, look for one that is um, local to you. I think Brother Nia was pointing out that um, a number of them uh, do actually cover uh, some of the core uh, sort of curriculum subjects of math, science and English um, and uh, also, in addition, uh, African or Black studies. Um, and then we also need to be thinking about our own media um, and collaboration. So these are some of the key things that we may already know, um, but that we're, we need to actually bring to bear in terms of trying to sort of move forward. I think um, it's also important um, from a business in terms of building our businesses up and actually um, helping to define the excellence that, we're, that we, we're looking to see in our businesses uh, to provide feedback so that they can continually improve and enhance the services that they provide to the community. Um, and um, on a final note, um, stop looking for validation outside of our community. Um, it's not going to happen. Um, and I think it's very important to sort of drive that point home uh, and, and look at our history pre-slavery in order to actually start to get a sense of personal pride yeah. um, and pride in our own identity. We validate ourselves. So yeah, um, yeah, I think those, those are some very, very great points to take um, forward and to think about. Uh, and as Sherelle said, um, please do continue to follow um, our um, efforts as um, the Black Knowledge Society. We are on social media. Um, I believe that the uh, social media um, information um, is all in the chat so for anyone that does want to follow. And um, we've also included the information for our two panelists um, as well. So um, if you want to find out more about the work of NABS or the work of B Empowerment, uh, please do um, use the information provided in the chat. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much. And we'd like to thank our esteemed guest panelists, Nia, Brother Nia Mara, and Chalice Richardson. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank so you, much. everyone. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for all your contributions.